Rival Caesars by Desmond Dilg. Chapter 3 The Secret Society. The gentle Gawain, Pellinore, Percival, Sir Kay of the Keen, and Lancelot, that evermore looked stolen wise on the Queen. The Death of Arthur. Now, in order that the reader may have a clear, consecutive, and proper comprehension of the happenings, both within and without the secret lodge, it is essential to go back upon our story somewhat. We must return, therefore, to the festive hall before the disappearance of the men, and long before... Let's try that again. We must return, therefore, to the festive hall before the disappearance of the men and long before Miss Betsy set out upon her venturous quest. Betsy, you dreadful little flirt, you're acting scandalously. There is Alec Hamilton over yonder looking as if he was about to be hung, and this is actually the fourth time tonight you have danced with this dark-eyed friend, the mysterious Mr. Burr, quote, the magic prince, as you call him. Unquote. Thus said Catherine Schweiler to her sister Elizabeth, who straightway replied, There now, you fault-finding dear, why you yourself dance thrice with Mr. Troop, while Moncrieff, who is I know in love with you, sulked sadly, and then in desperation danced with the two Clinton girls. As for the magic prince, he quite beglamoured me with his courteous and bewitching ways. When he talks to me, I feel like a princess, and he just makes me do anything he wants. And then his eyes, they're just too, too awful. Oh, Catherine, they pierce into one's soul, and his voice when he speaks, it is just like the tones of some wonderful fairy bell. I see you are in love with him, Betsy. But how about Alec? said Catherine. You can have him, Catherine. I know you like him, answered Betsy. But I have neglected him shamefully. I'll go over and talk to him and try to make him happy. Poor dear Alec. I like him too. He is such a good companion. But then he is so dreadfully sentimental and so full of flowery compliments. Whereupon Miss Betsy moved rapidly over to Hamilton's side and began talking to him in a happy-go-lucky, good-natured, bantering way. Now the Livingstons at the time of these happenings were one of the wealthiest families in New York. The founders of the family were of that hard, level-headed Scotch-Irish strain, renowned for its valor and partisanship, a strain that has given to America so many celebrated politicians, fluent orators, and dashing warriors. In the colonial days, when only property holders could vote or hold office, their influence was immense. They were very prolific, and their ramifications and affiliations with other of the old ruling families was quite phenomenal. They had countless cousins, sisters, aunts. Indeed, the Livingstons were more than a family. They were a tribe. Being staunch Presbyterians, all their instincts were entirely anti-royalist. And their great wealth in rents and trade proved of immense assistance to the revolutionary propaganda. Judge Livingston was wont to say, quote, When evil men bear sway, the place of honor is in the ranks of revolt. Unquote. A little wonder, therefore, that all his sons took an active part in the War of Independence and thereafter became prominent and successful political and mercantile chiefs. The family was closely connected with General Philip Schweiler's family, also with the Van Ranslers, Moncriefs, and Clintons. Thus the gathering of the evening was somewhat in the nature of a family reunion. Not more than three persons present were unrelated. It was, as it were, a rally of the clans. Now, Bessie Schweiler had hazel eyes and dark hair and a flesh, clear, healthy complexion. Her slender profile was very bewitching, her bust fully developed, and her manner bubbling over with human friendliness, joy of life, and animal spirits. A low-cut dress adorned around the edges with French lace exposed her snowy shoulders and breast. Upon a pillar-like neck, her well-formed head was firmly poised. 
She possessed a bright, happy, joyous smile, and over her high, square forehead a thick mass of lustrous hair was coquettishly combed back and fastened behind in a fashion peculiar to the time. Catherine, her sister, though about the same age, was more staid in manner, more mature and womanly, with a kind-hearted, good-natured, and somewhat studious expression. She was utterly without guile and deeply in love with Alexander Hamilton, though she felt in her heart that he was rather attracted toward her more beautiful and very vivacious sister. Betsy was frank and full of fun, everlastingly teasing or tormenting somebody, always laughing and romping, a regular little tomboy, yet withal well-bred and ladylike. She was extremely fond of music. The tones of the string band in the dance room seemed to shake her very soul with excitement. It was curious to observe, however, that when she talked to Aaron Burr, her whole demeanor changed. She became more subdued. She blushed, stammered. A wistful expression came over her face, and her half-hidden bosom heaved with rapid pulsations. One could plainly perceive that she was deeply in love with Burr, although she had not known him more than two hours. Even a tyro in the arts of Cupid could not fail to observe that Burr was first favorite. Hamilton saw it with some pique, but not over resentful feelings. Burr, being a splendid judge of character, understood Miss Betsy thoroughly. He paid her, therefore, every attention, as it was his nature to do. Her very evident liking for him flattered his vanity, though his heart remained wholly unmoved. Hamilton, on the other hand, admired Miss Betsy, and though he did not passionately love her, yet it was in his mind to woo and win her. His admiration for her was wholly of the judgment. He saw her many charms and attractions, and therefore had concluded in his own mind to make her his wife, if he could. He therefore never missed an opportunity to be by her side, and she thus had become accustomed to his attentions, compliments, and moods. Betsy looked upon him as a pleasant, handsome, and witty companion, and an accomplished, well-bred partner in the ballroom. It fed her womanly pride and instinct to know that the, quote, able young collegian, unquote, whom everybody praised so much and who, Quote, could talk like an angel and write like a prince, delighted to be her own special gallant laying siege to her maiden heart. Indeed, if the more fascinating Burr had not appeared upon the scene at this particular time, it is very probable Betsy would have married Hamilton within a year. Her parents, her parents, her parents both spoke of him as a promising young man, destined mayhap to fill a great role, and she well knew that quite a number of other fair maidens and heiresses in New York were, quote, setting their caps, unquote, at him, including her own sister Catherine. Mr. Hamilton, said Betsy, as they met you, look quite gloomy and out of sorts, as if your heart had grown old with some deep sorrow. What is the matter with you? Why didn't you come and ask me to dance as you used to do? You know I have been waiting for you all the evening. I thought, he replied with a bantering smile, that you appeared so charmed with the society and attentions of my mesmeric friend from Princeton that I did not consider it prudent to intrude. Mr. Bird is a real gay Lothario. He shines among the ladies. There he's in his element. Now, Mr. Hamilton, don't be so ill-natured, said Betsy coaxingly. You know I never forget old friends. Well, never mind, Miss Schweiler, he answered laughingly. Shall I have the honor and pleasure of dancing with you now? Ha ha, you jealous man, she laughed in mocking banter as they moved glidingly through the figure of the old-fashioned gavotte. I hope you don't kill Mr. Burr and hang up his gory head on an iron hook on the keep of your dungeon castle. That's the way it goes in the storybooks, you know, is it not? 
If you do, Mr. Hamilton, then it will be for me to jump into your castle moat and drown. Whereupon you'll go away to the wars and never smile again. Thus she bantered him from time to time as they danced gaily in the grand old stately way of our fathers. He felt young, strong, and happy, for he knew that for he knew that all the world was yet before him. "'You are getting positively dramatic, Miss Betsy,' he said to her in his most impressive tones. "'Nevertheless, I may be really going to the wars before long.' "'And will Mr. Burgo, too?' answered Betsy impulsively. Then she thought of the mistake she had made, and as a tear moistened her eyes, she continued, "'I hope you don't get wounded or killed, Mr. Hamilton. That would be too dreadful.' I must take my chances, Miss Betsy, with the rest. Men must fight, you know. It is in their nature. War is dreadful, Mr. Hamilton, said Betsy mechanically, because she had heard others say the same thing so often before. After enjoying themselves another hour with the ladies, Hamilton and Burr approached one another as if by prearrangement. Then they walked out of the dance hall by a side door and found themselves in a long, dark corridor, at the end of which a flickering oil lamp made the surrounding darkness very barely visible. Hamilton, whispered Burr, are they all here? Every one of them, and all are bold men and true, freedom and of good standing. Try that again. Every one of them, and all are bold men and true, free-born and of good standing, just as commanded in the ritual. Are they all brethren of the second degree? Yes, every man of them. Some of them have been obligated for years. Do they know the object of the gathering? inquired Burr. Yes, they are all enthusiastic for immediate action and eager for adventure. Uh, they are the right stuff for a revolution. Not a man among them has ever had his spirit broken. Who do you think we should select as our chief, Hamilton? I suggest Colonel Schweiler. First, because he is wealthy... and closely connected in business with all the leading men of New York. Second, because he is our personal friend. Thus, he is likely in many matters to be influenced by our purpose. Thirdly, because he is a mature man of sound practical judgment, a past master of the Iron Cross, knows the unwritten code by heart and is respected and known to nearly everybody of any consequence. He is the wealthiest man in the city. But in addition to that, replied Hamilton, smiling frankly at Burr, noting the effect of his words, I want to marry his daughter, Betsy, if you do not. The insinuation implied by Hamilton's words was thoroughly understood by Burr, who, without pretending to notice them, replied warily, I don't wonder at your weakness for the beautiful Miss Betsy. She is a most charming girl, and so is her sister. I see you have an eye for female loveliness, Hamilton. I congratulate you upon your choice. She is an heiress, too, I hear. Her father, I believe, is one of the largest patroon landowners in Albany and Saratoga. I can assure you, Hamilton, if you want to marry her, no opposition shall come from me. I am not your friend in name only, even in, if I loved her, which I don't. I would not say or do anything to prevent your success. I am a man of honor, Hamilton, and when I swear friendship to a man, I mean it. And as you've and as you have invited her father to be our most excellent chief, I see no objection to him, though personally I had a strong predilection for Judge Livingston. When I came to New York to find out how things really were, I brought with me several letters of introduction to the Livingstons, who, as you know, are related by marriage to my mother's family, the Edwards. Yes, answered Hamilton, you told me of it before. Livingston is a thoroughgoing man of the right color, but... So also is Schweiler. 
Between them they have all the hidden strings in their hands, as far as New York is concerned, and they are also in constant correspondence with the revolutionists in Boston and down south. I fancy also that Livingston is one of the Supreme Seven, whose identity is the standing mystery of our order. You mean the High Court of the Iron Cross? Yes. Burr and Hamilton, thus conversing, walk slowly down the dark corridor to where a glimmering oil lamp swung overhead at the far end. Here they found a white-bearded but powerful old man seated on a chair alongside of a heavy iron-studded oaken door. In his hand he held a long, broad-bladed, double-edged dagger with a square hilt of solid steel. As the two young men approached him from out of the dark and came under the glow of the lamp, he stood up and spake unto them in tones that conveyed both command and threat. As he spake, an iron door slid out of the wall behind them, and moving noiselessly across the corridor, it closed them in most effectively. Who goes there? the old man said as he brought his shining weapon to the point. A companion, replied Burr. A companion, repeated Hamilton. Advance companions too, and give the first sign of Om, spake the man on guard. Whereupon they stepped forward each at the same instant, making a peculiar movement of the left hand, ending at the left ear, and placing the right foot directly in front of the left. Whereupon the old man lowered his ugly-looking weapon, saying, Pass, brethren, the sign is right. The line is right, all is right. Go forward and fear not. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Hamilton walked on to the door and gave five peculiar knocks at irregular intervals, which were answered from the inside by a rubbing on the panel. Whereupon the great oaken door rolled back into the wall, and Burr and Hamilton entered. Just inside stood another guard or sentinel. He held in his hand a peculiar instrument with a sharp edge and shaped like a horseshoe. He also made a sign to them as they passed him, which mm, they returned. Then the door closed seemingly of its own volition, and a heavy red curtain rolled automatically across it. Upon the curtain was embroidered a gashed hand in these words, Tohuti tini tihimana ko na furar. I probably butchered that. Let's try it again. Tui, tui, tini, tihimana, ko nar, furar. Not sure what language that is. However, let's continue. The room or hall was oblong in shape with a stone fireplace, geometrically in the center, and raised dais at the north end. Its low roof was upheld by square stone pillars, and the walls were... Whitewashed. It was dimly lit by long wax candles and a large old-fashioned eight-day clock ticked steadily against the southern wall. Upon the dais were seven black armchairs, and around the room were a number of wooden benches or seats. At the northeast corner was what appeared to be a tomb or mausoleum built of wooden blocks and painted to look like granite. The floor was of stone flags, one of which swung easily open on a pivot if trod upon, displaying a dark yawning chasm down below from which a peculiar light shone. Attached to the roof were strange instruments and several sets of falling curtains, each curtain of a different color. The curtains hung on hooks and links made of white bone, and upon each curtain was painted emblematic scenes from the oral legend and the flaming scroll. Twenty-one men were present, mostly young men, all dressed in the, in the then height of fashion. The stamp of superior station, assured standing, and even of culture, was observable on the faces of many. The reader is here expected to remember that the American Revolution was led and organized entirely by men of independent position. Indeed, the wealthiest men of their day. Vivaciously they chatted together in groups, some sitting, some walking, some standing. 
the dangers of the times, the distracted state of the country, the trend of passing events, and the various personal charms and attractions of the ladies left behind in the ballroom were the principal subjects under discussion or dispute. However, as soon as Hamilton and Burr strode in, the buzz of voices gradually subsided, for everybody expectantly recognized in them the master spirits of the gathering. For a week past, Burr and Hamilton had been quietly yet successfully sounding their most trustworthy acquaintance. For a week past, Burr and Hamilton had been quietly yet successfully, quote, sounding, unquote, their most trustworthy acquaintances with regard to the formation of another private revolutionary lodge of the Iron Cross. Nearly every man approached consented to join. The first business transacted upon this particular evening was the election of a presiding officer, Colonel Philip Schweiler, nominated by Burr and seconded by Hamilton, was unanimously appointed to the position, formally chosen, quote, master of the hammer, unquote. He was thereupon installed by the United Brethren in due style. Each brother signified his allegiance to the, quote, wielder of the weapon by a sign and a symbolic word. Colonel Schweiler then seated himself in the left-hand chair upon the dais. Over his head on the wall hung the original rebel standard of the thirteen colonies. It consisted of bright orange silk with a hissing black rattlesnake coiled in the center. The snake had thirteen rattles, its head being raised menacingly as if to strike. Painted underneath the serpent was the extremely suggestive and eloquent motto, Don't Tread on Me. Four of the brethren then went over to a half-hidden alcove in the eastern wall, where they lifted up an oblong heavy object, carried it out, and ceremoniously placed it in front of the master of the hammer. Over this heavy object hung a black pall, afterwards hooked up to the low ceiling in the form of a square. Upon raising the cover, a common but very heavy pine coffin painted black was disclosed. On one side of the coffin, curious characters were traced apparently in some cryptic sign language, and on the other side, these words in plain English. But what are the words? There's nothing there but a question mark. Then with flint and steel, a small fire of dry resinous wood was lit in the exact middle of the hall by Judge Livingston. As the bright red flame flared up, a pungent but very pleasing odor pervaded the air. On top of the coffin, two yellow tapers were placed, one at each end, and upon the center lay an open book alongside a glass bowl of red liquid like unto blood. Also sticking through the coffin was a broad shining sword with a plain square hilt. The open book had iron leaves and raised gold characters. Thereon, and from it streamed forth a curious radiance which, in the semi-darkness, appeared to illuminate the space immediately around with a sort of magical, semi-religious glow. When subsequently the central fire became from time to time obscured during the course of the irrepress when subsequently the central fire became from time to time obscured during the course of the impressive and weird ceremonial a similarly mysterious light shone like a halo or aura from the broad gleaming blade of the uplifted sword End of chapter 3, Rival Caesars, by Desmond Dilg.